Priscilla and I have the privilege of talking a little bit more about AWS as it pertains to its value for nonprofits. So before we do that, I know we've got some chatter in the chat box, but I want to ask a quick question to the audience. Put a one in the chat if you currently have AWS promotional credits that you received from TechSoup. Again, thank you so much. I'm seeing Carlton has some credits. Daniel, wonderful. Um, so that leads me to believe there are certainly some others that don't even know uh, that the credits exist. So I want to take a brief moment to encourage everyone, in addition to tuning in and learning from today and from Angela, to explore the TechSoup uh, marketplace for Amazon Web Services promotional credits. We'll talk a little bit about this at the end, but AWS provides organizations all over the world with $1,000 in promotional credits once per year. So um, we really encourage you to take advantage of these credits through the TechSoup marketplace to help you bring to life a little bit more of what you're learning uh, from Angela today. So um, please, this is all about you. This is your time. We are here only to empower you to be successful on AWS. So engage with the chat, ask a lot of questions. You're here for a reason. So let's make the best of our time together. And with that, I'll pass it over to Angela to talk a little bit more about AWS for the nonprofit sector. Thank you, Jamin, and thank you, Arifa. Um, hi, everyone. So like Jamin mentioned, my name is Angela, and I am a solutions architect here at AWS. Um, I know the question of the day today is about weather. Um, I'm originally from Texas, but recently moved to Denver, so I'm struggling really hard in this cold weather, my first cold winter ever. Um, but yeah, so I've been with AWS for a little over a year and a half now. Um, I work primarily with nonprofit customers like yourself, and I'm extremely excited today to have the opportunity to talk to you about how you can design your roadmap for your nonprofit uh, cloud journey with AWS. How can you potentially use those $1,000 um, credit that Jamin spoke about today? And so hopefully after today's presentation, it will help spark some ideas, light some light bulbs to show how you can innovate with AWS. Um, and if you are unfamiliar with AWS or with what a solutions architect does, then no worries. That is why we're here today. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, so let's start by talking about what is AWS. Like Aretha mentioned, it stands for Amazon Web Services. And so how it happened is that we were operating Amazon.com, right? We operate Amazon.com for hundreds of millions of customers all over the world. And after a decade of operating Amazon.com, we realized we got very good at doing one thing, and that is operating massive scale technologies and data centers. So we thought, well, why not share the skills and technology and knowledge that we've gained from operating Amazon.com with other developers, businesses, organizations like yourself, so that you can take advantage of what we discover and build sophisticated, modern, and scalable applications. And that basically, in a nutshell, is what cloud computing is. So by definition, cloud computing is the on-demand delivery of IT resources via the internet with a pay-as-you-go pricing. And what that means is you no longer have to buy, own, or maintain your own physical infrastructure, and you can just utilize ours. We provide everything that you might find in the traditional data center. So that can be a server, um, a database, maybe it's a file server, a storage server, um, or um, maybe it's an active directory, right? But without you having to own or manage that physical infrastructure yourself, we maintain that technology for you in a secure environment and businesses can just access these resources via the internet or a private connection. So let me give you, give you an example. Let's say today you want to host a new website. Well, normally what you probably have to do is first of all, you gotta find somewhere to host those servers, right? Whether that is renting out a floor in a data center or cleaning our room in your current office. 
Then you gotta buy those servers. You have to then rack them and stack them, making sure the air conditioning is set up correctly for the cooling. Then you gotta hire the people to maintain it, manage it, and so on and so forth. As you can imagine, and might already be going through, this can become very cumbersome very quickly. It, the cost can get very high and it's very time consuming. Now, let's say you want to host a uh, website with AWS instead. Well, our model is a little different. It's kind of similar to how you get electricity currently in your house. You flip on a switch, you get electricity. You're not having to go out and generate your own electricity. And that's how AWS is, is except when you flip on a switch, instead of electricity, you get access to a server. And then with the server, now you can host a website. You can um, launch your file system on it. You can perform data, analy data analytics, stream videos, or pretty much anything that you can think of. And when you're done with this server, you flip off the switch and now you are no longer paying for it. So hopefully that kind of gives you an idea of what cloud computing is and what we can offer. Um, before we dive deeper into, you know, the specific things that we have to offer and more about cloud, I want to go through some examples of how some nonprofits are taking advantage of cloud technology. Now, when you go to any search engine and look up AWS and nonprofit, you'll find tons of use cases and examples. These three that I picked um, are just ones that I hope can really show you the breadth of how you can utilize AWS. So the first one I want to share with you is the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So their mission is to engage, teach, and inspire through the power of rock and roll. So in 2010, they established a libraries and archives. This is an effort to conserve archival content through digitization of the media that they have so that it is easier to be shared with the public. Some examples of the assets that they have are Hall of Fame induction ceremonies, um, digital copies of the Rolling Stone magazines, artist interviews, and live concert recordings from some of the most significant musicians of our times, such as uh, Paul McCartney, Prince, Elton John, et cetera. But what they found was that the storage medium that they were using, the technology was outdated. It was becoming expensive to manage and maintain, and it was prone to failure. And of course, right, all this precious content that they have, they don't want it on something that was prone to failure and potentially lose it. And so they realized they needed a centralized digital media repository that is capable of handling multiple types of assets and file formats that was not reliant on data technologies. And that was when they turned to AWS. And so what they did was they migrated to our storage service called Amazon S3, as well as our storage archival service called Amazon Glacier. And with that, they were able to preserve over 2,000 files that totaled to over 3,000 terabytes. And this migration was a success. They were able to preserve these assets, so they decided to take it even one step further by building a digital asset management system um, on top of AWS. So through this migration and these efforts, they were not only able to ensure that their assets were securely preserved, but also it has allowed them greater access to their archival content and therefore has facilitated better internal efficiencies. Another customer use case I want to share with you is code.org. So code.org is dedicated to expanding access to computer science education by providing free K through 12 computer science curriculum through their website. And so every year they host a week long event called um, Hour of Code, where over 100 million students in more than 180 countries will visit their websites um, to do some coding activities. And this typically leads to 10 times more traffic than what they used to see on a day-to-day -day basis. And so they reached out to AWS because they were searching for a solution that offers both scalability as well as availability. So something that allows them to scale and accommodate this large event while ensuring that the students have a good experience with their website, that there are no crashes, there are no disruptions, et cetera. 
And they were able to accomplish that with AWS. So code.org runs all of their platform as well as all of their hour code events on top of AWS. And they take advantage specifically of these features that we have called auto scaling. And so just like its name, auto scaling means that applications can automatically scale up to meet the demand of the um, traffic. And when the demand is no longer needed, the application then can scale down. The additional servers can then be taken down so that you stop paying for it. Because of the scaling capability that they took advantage of, our uh, code.org actually was able to save over $1.3 million a year because they're not having to keep those excess servers running just to accommodate for that one week of um, special event that they have. And so I feel like the story here really highlights the flexibility of utilizing cloud technology. The last one I want to share with you is the LA LGBT Center. So the LA LGBT Center wanted to establish a call center to support incoming inquiries from their community regarding their health and services uh, programs. They were looking to establish a virtual call center and they explored many other options, including Amazon Connect, which is our omni-channel contact center service in the cloud. And they found that with Amazon Connect, they were able to build a basic call center in just a matter of minutes. And within the week, they had a fully operational call center taking live calls from their community for their health and services programs. They were amazed at the speed that they were able to go from an idea to a testing environment to fully production in just a week. And now they can take the valuable time that they saved and use those towards progressing towards their mission. Um, and with this workload, they were able to serve over 30,000 clients in the clinic. And one thing I want to highlight is the scalability of Amazon Connect allowed the LA LGBT Center to serve their clients throughout COVID-19 without having to add any additional headcount to their call center. So this workload was a success. So they thought, well, why not try out a uh, televised fundraising event instead? So with this telethon event comes um, increased call volumes from their donors and supporters. And they were able to quickly spin up a call center just overnight to help with this atypical increase in calls. And their call center was able to scale seamlessly to meet the increase in demand and they were able to scale up and down as the volume of the callers changed. And they only had to pay for the capacity that they used, and there were no upfront costs that they had to pay. And this fundraising event turned out to be a huge success, and they raised nearly $1.3 million. So I hope those three stories really highlight it and kind of give you an example to see, you know, what other people are doing with technology. And I'm going to touch on more ways that you can use with uh, AWS for your organization. But before I do that, I want to take a pause here and see um, where is the crowd in terms of your experience with the cloud. So if you could put a one in the chat for me, if you are uh, maybe today's one of the first time you've heard of cloud technology. Maybe you've only heard of the letters AWS, but you didn't understand, you know, exactly what we offer. Um, put a three in the chat if you are someone who already has some workloads running in the cloud, whether that be AWS or other cloud providers. Um, and put a two if you are somewhere in between. Okay, so I see quite a few of threes. So we have some cloud experience. I do see some twos as well. So we have a lot of in-betweens and experienced people here. All right, well, great. Thank you all so much for um, participating and answering my question. Um, that kind of gives me an idea of you know, what the audience is. So now um, I want to talk about how some of the benefits of moving to the cloud. And you know, if you're someone who is a three, maybe you're already realizing some of these 
benefits. Um, and maybe I can point out additional benefits that didn't come to mind previously. Um, and maybe if you're a two, I can help um, shed some lights and how you can move towards um, becoming uh, more familiar with the cloud and wanting to move towards the cloud. And so, you know, earlier we talked about the three organizations that uses AWS, right? So Rock and, Hall, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame uses AWS to preserve their digital content, which helps them educate more people on the legacy of rock and roll. Code.org uses AWS's auto scaling so that they can meet the demand for that hour code event so that more students have a chance to learn coding skills. And the LA LGBT Center went from nothing to a virtual call center overnight and had a successful fundraising event that allowed them to raise money to put towards their mission. And so the common theme across these stories is that these organizations found value in using cloud technology and was able to use, further their mission by running the applications in the cloud. So in this technology world, right, where technology is advancing at a very fast speed, these organizations understood that they need to innovate with technology, but instead of becoming like a tech company themselves, they simply utilize AWS existing technology and look for ways where our technology aligned with their mission that where we can help them achieve their missions. And so I mentioned before, right, that with cloud computing, a lot of times um, the you'll find whatever you can find in traditional data center, you can find with cloud computing, such as servers, databases, storage server, etc. These are what we call the building blocks, right, that allow you to put all these building blocks together and build these solutions out of it. But we do also offer fuller and more complete solutions such as a translation service or artificial intelligence um, for extracting texts from pictures from PDFs or artificial intelligence for personalized marketing for your donors. Um, we have call center, like I mentioned earlier, we have um, virtual desktop offerings, right? And much, much, much more. So as you can see, we offer both building blocks tools for you to build almost anything that you can think of, but we also offer tools that you can use directly outside the box. And so at the beginning, I mentioned that I am a solutions architect. Now, if you have not get to interact with a solutions architect or have not heard of this, um, one of the things that I do is to understand what is um, your organization's mission, what it is that you're trying to accomplish. And I learned the ins and outs of these 200 plus services that we have to offer and help you align your mission with the technology that we have to offer and help support you and educate you as you experiment and build your application. And what's even better is that I am a free resource to you. Um, me and my fellow solutions architects are here to help. And throughout the rest of this presentation, I'll continue to call out ways where you can um, take advantage of your solutions architect and your AWS account team. So now I want to share with you five of the most common and biggest benefits that we identify other nonprofits that they gain from either building a application with AWS or migrating their existing application to the cloud. So first is the ability to easily experiment with new ideas. So let's say that you want to try out a cloud-based call center like the LA LGBT center. Well, we have a service for that. What you can do is you can go and turn on the service, try it out for yourself. And let's say that for whatever reason that you don't really like it, no worries, turn off the switch and shut it down. There are no risk, no long-term contract and no lingering costs. And a lot of times we actually offer free quota and free trial periods for a lot of our services to allow our customer to experiment and try out our services. And let's say that um, you know the free quota, the free trial is not enough for you to really see the value of a service, you want more, or maybe the service you want to try does not offer that free trial, then you know this is one of the ways where the thousand dollar from TechSoup can really come in. We see that typically as long as you know you properly turn off these services, that $1,000 is going to be more than enough to cover any trial. The second benefit 
is scalability. So imagine that you have a fundraising application that is going to be launched next week and you are expecting additional traffic. So again, similar to the LA LGBT um, example that I shared with you earlier. So what you could do and probably traditional would have to do is you would have to provision, provision enough resources so that it can handle the peak demand and uh, making sure your application does not crash. But what would be even better is if you can provision just enough resources based on the demand and the amount of traffic at a specific time so you're not having to pay for additional um, excess resources. And that's something that you can achieve with the cloud, which leads to the third benefit, which is cost savings, right? Because you're not having to pay 24-7 for resources that are not needed. And this allows you to reduce cost. On top of that, there are no contracts, no upfront costs, and you only have to pay for what you use on a month to month basis. And um, additionally, one thing I want to highlight is at AWS, we pass the cost savings back to our customers. And since our launch in 2006, we've actually reduced our price uh, for 115 times now, and we don't plan to stop that anytime soon. The fourth um, benefit of moving to the cloud, fourth reason why we see customers move to the cloud is the pace of innovation. So we're constantly building new services, adding new features to our existing services, and our roadmap is largely determined by what our customer asks us to build. So we get to benefit from your cool new ideas, you telling us what is needed right now in the field, and you get to benefit from the fact that we're constantly innovating and improving. And so let's say, right, you want to add a um, translation service to your website. You want to maybe add a chatbot to your website. Well, traditionally, you might have to go out and build that from scratch yourself. But using AWS and the technology that we have to offer, you no longer have to do that. And with the time and resources that you saved for not having to build from scratch, you get to now take that time and energy and put towards um, your organization's mission and what makes your organization unique. The fifth benefit of cloud computing and moving to um, AWS is global footprint. So AWS allows our customers to deploy globally in minutes. That is not an exaggeration or a metaphor. From wherever you're sitting right now, Conroe, Wisconsin, Maine, you can launch a server all the way across the globe in Asia and Japan if you want right now. And this is very um, beneficial for our customers who have a global presence. One thing we also offer is we have a global content delivery network. So this allows your customers who may not be in the same physical location as you to still be able to access your application with the same great experience as your customers who may be right next door to you. So I touched on you know, the benefits and what drives people to move to the cloud, but I understand that cloud is not necessarily the answer to everything and it does not come without challenges. So I want to share with you the three most common concerns that I hear when I first meet with customers. First is cloud sprawl. So this happens when there is no one leading charge or defining best practices in a cloud journey. And this typically leaves either a single team or a single person to work on AWS. While this technically might work, it runs the risk of sprawl. And the other thing is I see many organizations who have um, adopted third-party solutions or software as a product um, solutions that they use out of the box because it's nice, it's easy, and it's ready to go. But this potentially leads to cloud sprawl because there's a lack of consistency. Maybe now you want to bring data together from the different softwares, from the different um, SaaS products, but they, they don't have the same data format and it's hard to bring them together. Or maybe they have different security requirements, different logins, et cetera. And so that lack of consistency can become a challenge. 
The next that I hear a lot is a small IT team. So I, a lot of times here organizations tell me that they want to innovate, but their IT team are their IT team is overwhelmed as it is. They don't have the right people. Their team is not experienced with the cloud. Uh, maybe it's a one man shop that that's not really even a team, right? And so that's another concern that I hear quite often. And the last one is limited funding. So the perception of there's not enough funding to start or make progress. Now, these are all very real, very valid concerns and challenges, and you are definitely not alone. We have experiences working with thousands of nonprofit customers just like you who share these same concerns with us. But you might be surprised to find that there are tons of ways to get around these challenges or other unnamed challenges that are not listed here. So for example, if your concern is limited funding, well, we have credit programs such as the TechSoup $1,000 credit program that we talked about today. We have grants um, that you can utilize. If your concern is that you have a small IT team or your IT team is not necessarily um, fluent in cloud technology, well, we have partners who can come in and help you. We have um, teams who specialize in certain topics such as migration that can come in and assist you or data analytics. Um, we also have trainings and webinars such as this one where you can um, utilize for your team to upskill on their cloud technology. And I can go on and on, right? So the point here is that uh, we are here to help you address these challenges and help you find the right resources to help you move forward. So basically, we are ready to help you get started whenever you are. And so in this next part of the presentation, I want to share with you a framework that we have laid out, which I believe will help your organization feel ready as well. All right, so I know a lot of y'all earlier were saying that you were a two somewhere in between trying to get there. So you might be wondering, okay, well, I see the value proposition of the cloud, but I don't know how to get started, right? Where do we go from here? You talked about a lot of great stories, um, but their stories are different from mine. So how do I get started? So this is the framework that I spoke about earlier. Now, we understand that you know, every customer is different, that every customer's journey is going to look different. But we found that some of the most successful cloud journeys, we were able to distill their journey into four cyclical steps. Now, the key word here is cyclical. Being okay with an iterative approach like this is very important because this will help you build momentum and learn from experience without setting goals that feel unrealistic or unattainable. So just having the mindset that you know, your cloud journey is not going to be a one and done journey, it's going to be a cycle of learning and continuing to improving on those things that you've learned. So I'm going to touch on these phases uh, very quickly at a high level before diving deeper into them in just a second. So first we have on the top left, the envision phase. This is where you are identifying what do you want to do and why is it, what, why are you picking this project? Why are you doing this? Identifying the goals, the priorities and the workloads that you want to innovate, as well as the success criteria that you are going to measure these projects against and assign a leader to each of these projects. And that's someone who can drive change from um, internally. After you identify the why and the what, we then move on to the align phase where you're identifying the who. You, this is where you are looking, identifying the gaps that your organization currently has. So who is going to work on this project? Do we have the right skill set in house? Do we maybe need to reach out externally to partners? If we involve partners, how much do we want them to help us? Do we just want help building it or do we want help maintaining it down the road too? Do we maybe have contracts and licenses that we need to take into consideration here? So in this phase, it is extremely important to have those questions asked and have those concerns answered and build trust amongst all the people that are going to be working on this project and getting everyone on the same page. 
So once you identify the why and the what, you identify who's going to work on it, then you can move on to the launch phase. And this is where you get to start building. So this is where you're building a pilot project and more importantly, being able to demonstrate value from that pilot project. Did we meet our goals, right? Did we meet the success criteria that we had laid out during the envision phase? If not, what do we learn from this pilot project? What can be improved? And let's take those feedback and let's try it again, right? And so let's say, you know, you iterated a couple of times, you, you got to a pilot project and it worked and it met the success criteria. So now you're ready to move on to the scale phase, which just like its name is where you're scaling up your pilot project to a production level application. And this is where you want to make sure you are realizing the value from your investment and you're continuously looking for opportunities to learn and grow. Now, one thing I want to mention is that these four phases here, they're not meant to be a timeline. It's more meant to be a structure, right? So wherever you are, being able to see ahead of what should come next, um, hopefully this structure will help kind of guide your organization and help drive progress. So now, before I move on to, you know, dive deeper into each, each of these phases, I want to understand, based on that high, high level definition that I just went through, where do you think you and your organizations are right now? So put a one in the chat if you are at the envision phase where you are establishing goals and projects to work on. Put a two if you have a project in mind and you are now um, you know, looking for people to work on it and trying to get everyone on the same page. Three for launch, if you're already building a pilot project um, or starting to build a pilot project. And four, if you are already running the application in full production mode and you're getting ready to go back to the drawing board for your next project. Okay. So I initially see quite a bit of ones, then I'm seeing some twos, threes, and fours. Looks like we've got a pretty good mix here. All right. Okay, we have a pretty good um, spread. Do you see a little bit more ones? Um, all right, thank you all so much for participating. So, uh, wherever you are right now, the next um, thing I want to touch on is I want to step through each phase and give you some ideas or some questions that you could be asking yourself um, to help you get to that next phase, right, uh, wherever you are. So let's start with the envision phase. So again, envision phase is about having goal, identifying projects to innovate, your priorities, knowing the why, right? So is it because of cost, right? Are we looking for cost savings? Are we looking for better efficiency? Is it because we want to utilize AWS because we need access to technology that we currently do not have, right? So knowing the um, why, as, uh, why of your cloud journey. So if you are here in the envision phase, what now, right? What should you be doing to help you move towards that align phase? Now, before I do that, I wanna take a step back because I did see quite a bit of ones in the chat. So maybe you're someone who, you know, you understand that you need to innovate, but you don't quite, you're not quite sure how to set that project or set that goal. So you may be wondering, well, how do I know what to work on? So one recommendation that I have for you and your team is look back to your organization's mission, right? Because your organization's mission at the end of the day, that is what you are all about and let that help inform your goal. So let me give you an example. Let's say I am a nonprofit that helps with local food banks. I'm a, I'm a local food bank nonprofit. So my mission, right, is to reduce food insecurity and um, provide greater access to food for the people in my community. So maybe my goal in this case then is try to understand how do I more efficiently deliver food to people in my community or more efficiently gather donations, whether it be food, monetary, from my volunteers. So now that I have some goals, what projects could I work on? 
well, maybe I need a better channel for my community members to interact with me, whether that is through a chat bar or through a texting bot, right? Or maybe um, we need to have a dashboard to showcase the impact of the donations that the volunteers are providing us, because if they see the impact of their donation, maybe they're going to be more willing to give down the road, right? Maybe I need better email campaigns that are more personalized to target different groups of people, right? And so those are just kind of some quick examples to kind of show you how, uh, hopefully get some gears turning. So if you're still, if after looking at your mission and you're still not quite sure what to work on, some questions I invite you to ask yourselves is what is preventing you and your organization from dedicating time to move towards your organization's mission? What is taking your time, your resources, your money, energy, uh, manual work that you don't want to be doing anymore? What can be improved? All right, so going back to the food bank example. So maybe right now I am manually backing up the database that holds all of my volunteers information. Um, and that's becoming very time consuming. Or maybe that um, I don't have an application in place that my volunteers can use, that they can plan out the best route to deliver food for the homebound individuals. Um, maybe it's that I have historical data on the community members that I am serving. Um, and I want to do some sort of analysis on this data to see if there's some trend that can help me improve my organization, build new programs for my uh, mission, for my food bank, right? So hopefully that helped jock some ideas and kind of show you how the train of thought could potentially happen. So now you have a project, you have a goals. It is important to identify the leader who will drive change. And I will touch on a little bit in a sec why that leader is so important. Um, and then now you may be wondering, well, where does AWS fit into all of this, right? Where can I and my team come in to help you? Well, first of all, I want to mention that at AWS, we're not going to um, advertise to you or try to sell you a service, right, or a one-size-fits-all solution because it doesn't work. The nonprofit community is so vast and so diverse. We have nonprofits who works on food insecurity, who works on um, education achievement gaps, who works on um, medical research and so on and so forth. It doesn't make sense to have one service or one solution for such a diverse community. Instead, what we like to do is work backwards. And this is actually a concept that we use to drive our product um, launches and how we work with our customers. So basically, what we can do is look at your challenge, what it is that you're trying to accomplish, the goal you're trying to achieve, and then work backwards from that, trace our steps backward and see how can we get to the end goal there? How can we um, use our technology to help you reach the goals that you have set? So you've identified the why and the what. Now we get to the align phase. And again, this is where you identify who will work on this project. And this is why that leader, establishing that leader during the envision phase is so important because this leader who's driving this project is going to be the person who's asking all the right question and all the hard question, right? Who's going to be working on this project? Do we have the right skill set? If not, what are we going to do about it? When is this project supposed to be done? How are we going to get it done? Not only um, is the leader needing to be asking these hard questions, making sure that everyone is on the same page about the answers to these questions are also very important. And so if you are someone who answered too early or you were in the align phase trying to gather the who's, how do we move on from here, right? How do we go from here so that we get to the launch phase and start building? Well. Um, like I said, you want to make sure you identify the who. And one thing I want to stress is that this is going to be everyone who will be involved from the beginning to the end. So this is that leader. This is your developers who are going to be working on the application. This is your cloud team, whether that is your internal IT team or the partner team if you decide to engage partners. This is also your end users. So your end users are the people who are going to be using this application. So if you're building a dashboard, that is your um, maybe your community members who are looking at your donation dashboard. Or maybe it's an internal dashboard for your executive leaders. Maybe it is your admins who are going to be operating the database, right? 
And so having all these different stakeholders that is going to be involved from the beginning to the end and have everyone voice out their fears, their blockers and their hesitations for, these pro for this project, for this goal is very important. So for example, right, one concern that we repeatedly touch on is um, a lot of times I hear concerns about not enough expertise in house. Well, if um, you voice that concern here, we can come in and help, right? We have partners, like I mentioned, that can help you build or even down the road, help you maintain the application. We have trainings, webinars, documentations, blog posts, um, lots and lots of resources for you to kind of get past those fears. So hopefully you get the idea here. Getting those fears out, those um, concerns out, voice them early can help everyone to be on the same page and have everyone feel committed and ready to get started. So, you know, we gone through the first two phases, our concerns, you know, you shared them with your account team, we were able to address those. And now we move on to the launch phase. So how would you know if you were successful? This phase here is all about putting together a pilot project and actually start building. So let's say you're here, what next, right? Well, if you are someone who answered a three, um, this is where you want to identify what to build for your pilot project. Now you may be asking, well, how do I identify which features or what to include in my pilot project? Think back to the working backward concept that I shared with you just now. Everything at this point needs to be able to be traced back to your initial goals. Don't let the technology at this point, the services that you're working with sidetrack you or um, make you get distracted, right? Focus on the big picture here. These pilots should have clear goals and metrics to demonstrate value. At this point, you need to always be asking yourselves, where do the values lie, right? And identify what technical constraints keep you from realizing it. Am I, am I seeing the goals achieved that I had laid out back in the envision phase? Am I meeting those success criteria? And this phase, how AWS can come in and help is we can maybe, for example, help you understand the uh, pilot project, right? What to include in the pilot project to help demonstrate that value and goal to you and your team. Maybe we have we can offer credit programs, right, to help fund your pilot project, um, help you identify, connect you at this point with partners who can help you build that um, POC, that proof of concept, um, and help you identify gaps. And so all that to say that we have resources, again, to help you move forward. So last phase is the scale phase. At this phase, right, it's very important for you to measure your progress against your original goals. Do we meet them? Are there still gaps? If so, that's okay. Um, this is an opportunity for you to pivot and adjust as needed and iterate and improve. One very important thing about this phase is this is where you want to make sure that every part of your organization knows what is their part in continuing to make this project successful, right? We built it, but we need to make sure we maintain it so it remains successful. So for example, uh, maybe your finance team, right? Maybe they're not as involved throughout the entire process, but this is where they need to be upskilled on how to use our cost exploration tool, our budgeting tools, um, so that they understand how the billings work or your operations team. Um, they might need to know how to engage with AWS support. And at this point, if you're like most of our customers, you'll find that your first win will spark many other ideas and projects. The first one is always going to be the most difficult, just like anything else. But once you begin, it will almost be like an immediate flywheel effect. So before I wrap up the presentation, um, throughout the whole time, right, I mentioned that we're here to help. We have um, resources to help you. Um, I wanna touch on some of the uh, resources that we have here um, at AWS to help you get started. So first, as you know, as I mentioned, the credit program that TechSoup provides you that $1,000 in AWS promotional credit that you can use to apply to any experiment um, that you might want to do with AWS um, or apply it to your initial usage, right? Or to the pilot project if you are at that phase right now. 
Uh, we also have a vast partner network that you can take advantage of and work with. So these partners have worked um, a lot of different workloads with, um, we have nonprofit specific partners who knows this industry, the space very well. And they can help you build a website, um, perform migrations, launch a database, um, build a full analytics workload, machine learning, anything you can think of. Um, whatever it is you're trying to build, you know, we have um, resources that can come in and help you with that partners. We also have a nonprofit technical hub where you can find a lot of different technical resources, documentations um, that can help you learn more about the cloud. And uh, finally, we are here to help. So as I mentioned throughout, I am a free resource to you. So is your account manager, who is typically going to be your point of contact uh, for anything AWS related. And so if you want us to come in and help you, whether that is, you know, match the technology to your um, challenge or whatever it is, um, the examples I mentioned throughout today, you know, please feel free to scan the QR code in the middle here and fill out that contact form so that we can get in contact with you and start helping you um, with your AWS cloud journey. Um, so that wraps up my presentation for today and hopefully you um, we're able to get some ideas on how to advance your organization and innovate with AWS. Um, so with that, I'm going to pass the mic to Jamin because I think he's the one that's been kind of taking down the questions um, since I was unable to see them throughout. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Angela. That was uh, very thorough, very well presented, and we really appreciate you doing that and being here with us today. We did get a handful of different questions. So I'll just read them to you. I've done my best to kind of uh, uh, point uh, or, or respond briefly in the chat, but then you can share a little bit more uh, broadly. So um, we received a question about using Salesforce and its potential integration to AWS. So this organization is using a lot of Salesforce uh, solutions and they're interested in hearing some different use cases on the ways that AWS and Salesforce can integrate. Yeah, so that's actually a very common use case that I hear a lot from my customers. And <clears throat> actually, it's such a common use case that this year, I think a month ago at Dreamforce, um, we announced or they announced a, a solution that we worked on together with Salesforce where you can um, pipe your data from Salesforce directly into AWS. And it's a solution that you can directly get from Salesforce Marketplace. And this allows you to take those data that you have inside Salesforce, bring them to AWS and allowing you to do any sort of analytics that you might want, right? So maybe it's, you know, you want to better understand your members um, or your um, organization, right? And so having that uh, integration um, is a use case that I do see very um, often and is something that we now have a solution for um, and joined force with Salesforce. Wonderful, thank you. Yeah, I put the link in the chat there. You're exactly right. It's super timely in terms of um, the announcement. So the next question has to do with a donor and member engagement and AWS's value for that. So I'll speak really briefly to it. Well, actually, I'll pass the mic over to you, actually. And then I want to talk a little bit about this new program that AWS is launching uh, at reInvent. Um, but uh, beyond the call center, which you alluded to in the context of the LGBT center, the LA LGBT center, can you speak a little bit more about some use cases as it pertains to AWS's value for fundraising, donor, and member engagement? Yeah, so one thing I think I see a lot is the um, email campaign I think I briefly talked about. So we have um, you know, services that allow you to have personalized email campaigns that allow you to reach out to your donors, right? Um, through different platforms, whether that is text message, whether that's push notification or email messages, right? And being able to kind of tailor those campaigns to your individual donors, I think is something that a lot of our customers find very valuable. Um, another thing I do hear a lot is um, dashboards, right? So we have um, services that can do data analytics and that help you to visualize those data um, and being able for the donors to kind of see those dashboards and see kind of where the organization is progressing. Um, I think it's something that I do hear quite a bit too. 
Excellent. Yeah. And, and to that point, um, we have a new program that's coming uh, live. It's actually um, currently live, although being more broadly announced uh, at reInvent. But if you're an organization here that is interested in learning more about how AWS can support your organization specifically for fundraising, donor, and member engagement, please do reach out to me. I have the inside scoop for that uh, new program. Again, it'll go live with the press release uh, at reInvent, which is in just a couple of days. But while we're in an intimate group here and uh, uh, we love TechSoup and its members, I wanted to give you the opportunity. So I'm putting my email address in um, the chat. Uh, but again, if you're an organization looking for more support, whether it be funding or technical support or um, otherwise, as it pertains to AWS for fundraising and donor member engagement, please do reach out. Another question to move along for you, Angela, is um, a little bit more about AWS's value for website development and website hosting. Um, this question says that they're familiar with Route 52 for hosting and EC2 and S3 for uh, some storage, um, but what are the best ways to build out a solution as it pertains to website hosting and website development? Yeah, so in the website space, we have many, many different services for customers who have different needs, right? So if you have a static website, then maybe we can do it with S3. If you have um, other, you know, service side website that you're trying to build, we can look into an EC2, like you mentioned, um, with the servers. Um, we also have developer tools, right, such as um, AWS Amplify that allow you to just worry about the code and not worry about the underlying infrastructure and be able to launch your website that way. And so what I would recommend in this case is um, go ahead and scan that QR code and reach out to us so that, you know, we can understand what is specifically your needs are, uh, what type of applications that you're building, um, and, you know, what is the usage for it whatsoever. So then we can recommend the best solution um, and match you with the best service that we have. Wonderful. And I think that leads me to another kind of main point that I saw in this uh, question is just along the lines of the fact that this is a lot of content, right? There are hundreds of different services and solutions that AWS can help your organization. And I love that we are stopped on this slide because it's critical to understand that we don't expect you to take in everything that we just discussed. That's not the point of this. The real point of this is just to maybe encourage you to raise your eyebrow, to think a little bit differently about what you're currently doing and think about how you can walk with AWS into the future. I mean, uh, cloud for what it's worth is no longer really about if, but more about when as it pertains to uh, coming it, it, deeper into the sector. So we wanna make sure that your organization is poised and primed for success and mission impact. So again, it really depends on your organizational needs. And I love that we have these dedicated resources to really understand what your organization is uniquely and how we can support you. So. Um, one last question, I think, given our time. Um, give me one sec. Okay. Um, so this question uh, says, we are interested in storing our files in the cloud rather than on a local server, keeping, keeping it easy for the end user. How would you suggest we go ahead and get started? Yeah, so I think my recommendation, you know, again, at AWS, we have for storage services, we have many, many storage services, right? We have ones for different operating systems. We have ones for different use cases. Um, and I think the best way, again, is to reach out so that I can understand, you know, or my fellow tech solutions architect can better understand what that use case is, you know, whether it is maybe, you um, 
you know, we need, uh, like you said, your end users need it. We need a Windows file server, or maybe it is um, something else. We can help match you with the best service. And um, like I mentioned earlier, we also have teams who specialize in specific areas and migration is one of them, right? And so um, maybe we need to connect you, right? With those teams to help you understand what's the best way to migrate over to AWS and to have that capability for your end users. Wonderful. So again, I think you uh, double clicked on that point in terms of really getting in touch. Um, I'll, I'll thank you again, Angela, and thank you all for taking the time to learn more. Um, please do reach out. Uh, we are here to support you. Ultimately, your success is our success. I mean, you've taken the time out of your busy days to join us on this webinar. So let us help you go to that next level. I mean, the resources are there, whether it's a funding or technical support, we understand how important the work that you're doing is to your communities and to the world at large. So thank you again. Um, I uh, will put my email address one more time. Um, if you want to ask any other additional questions, um, Again, Angela, you were wonderful, really thorough. So thank you as well. And have a great rest of your day, everyone. We'll be in touch.